So without further ado, I would like to go ahead and introduce our first speaker who is coming to us remotely, and that is Dr. Scott Lindquist. He completed his medical training at the University of Washington School of Medicine as a student of the WAMI, that's Washington, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho program. And he completed a residency in pediatrics at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and an infectious disease fellowship at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. He then completed his master's of public health at the Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Lindquist has drawn upon his broad background to focus upon underserved populations and infectious diseases. He has combined all the aspects of his training as a health officer, director of health for the Kitsap County Health District from 2001 to 2014. And in addition, he serves as a pediatrician and public health officer at the Port Gamble Sklalem Tribal Medical Clinic, where he's worked one day a week for the past 17 years. And I believe that is where he is coming to us from today. Dr. Lindquist has yeah. been Washington State Tuberculosis Medical Consultant since 2002 and currently serves as, as the State Epidemiologist for Communicable Diseases and the Deputy Health Officer for Washington State. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Scott Lindquist. Yep. Yeah, thanks. I just want to do a quick uh, audio check to make sure you guys can hear me okay. Are you guys there? Uh, I think you have me muted. Yes, no, we, we can hear you well, Dr. Lindquist. Okay, great. All right, well, thanks a lot. Sorry to bore you with that big opening CV bio about Scott Lindquist, but um, probably the only thing that wasn't mentioned that's probably the most important thing is um, I indeed was a civil surgeon for about 15 years. So I have a good sense of what the civil surgeon is looking for and what their job entails. And this is a tough uh, population to to deal with for very many uh, reasons, one um, of which the epidemiology we're going to talk about. So if you could go to the next slide. This is uh, interesting, uh, a look at foreign-born populations in the United States. And, you know, I'm sitting in a Native American clinic, and their interpretation of this is, is much different than um, what yours may be. But this shows the foreign-born population, the darker the color, the more population that's foreign-born across the U.S. And it's really fascinating to look at, well, clearly Washington State, you look in the Puget Sound area, that was a fairly high number of foreign-born folks, but you see a concentration in the Midwest, the North, uh, Northeast, and uh, some in California, Texas, but most of this of the United States was not um, having a lot of foreign-born folks, but Washington at that time was. Next slide. Uh, and if you look at current foreign-born population, it's a much different picture than that one. Flip back to the one before again. So look at this picture. Look where the dark areas are. Um, and then flash ahead. Uh, it's a much different distribution of foreign-born population in the U.S. What remains somewhat constant, though, is uh, Washington State and the Puget Sound area having a high concentration of foreign-born. And again, the darker the color, the, the higher the percentage of foreign born. So next slide. And to put this in a graph form, if you're looking back in 1900s, the, the top line is Washington State foreign born. 22% of the population was foreign born. And um, contrasting that to the United States of 13%, we have had a higher percentage of foreign born. Now this fell through the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and then started to have a rise again where we match the US um, percentage of foreign born, which is around 13%. So um, that is why our numbers in the Northwest have remained fairly high compared to the rest of the United States. Next slide. And if you look at these regions of birth, which is really important for um, epidemiology of diseases that we're talking about. So the diseases of significance for you as a civil surgeon are obviously TB, HIV, syphilis. Those are the things you worry about, but I'm gonna talk to you about a couple other things that I think we should worry about as civil surgeons 
And um, if you look at the region of birth for our foreign-born residents, that 35% coming from the Americas, 14% from Europe, 43% from Asia, that really gives us uh, the top five countries, Mexico, China, Philippines, and India. And why I highlight this is China, Philippines, and India are really the high burden countries for TB. So clearly, for us as civil surgeons, tuberculosis is, is way more prevalent in this population that we're evaluating uh, for adjustment status. Next slide. And if you look at the number for Washington State, the new lawful permanent residents, um, they're fairly constant, but we're talking about 25,000 plus uh, lawful permanent residents um, every year. That's pretty impressive. Next slide. And again, for new naturalized citizens in Washington, um, the time to naturalization is eight years. That's a, that is a long haul for many of the patients that we're taking care of. Just a reminder, that's what makes this population um, tough to deal with as a civil surgeon, is there's a lot of years and a lot of investments and a lot of fears and concerns and prejudice and all kinds of things that we as the front line as civil surgeons need to be open-minded and uh, sensitive to this. And again, in, uh, in people here, you can see the difference between 2016, 17, and 18. Okay, next slide. So this is it in a snapshot. I'm giving you what's going on in Washington State. These are the challenges. These are the 10-year infectious disease trends in Washington State to put in context the diseases that are really on the rise. And of course, syphilis here in the upper corner um, or in the bottom corner is one of the diseases we're screening for. And what this slide shows you, this is a typical what we call an epidemiology curve, which is the number of cases on one axis and time on the other, shows that um, Washington, there's a problem. We have a syphilis problem. And we're seeing a, a market increase in syphilis. Now, granted, a lot of the syphilis cases we're seeing are in men who are having sex with men, and also um, it's uh, tied into um, drug use, but a lot of these are foreign-born folks also. So this is is truly, um, an increase in disease that I'm concerned about as the state epi that many of you are going to be dealing with directly. Gonorrhea, similar, very similar. Again, we're not required to um, test for gonorrhea, but just making sure that you understand the epidemiology in Washington State over the last 10 years, showing us a massive increase in gonorrhea, a massive increase in syphilis, and not to be outdone is hepatitis C. Now, if there's any disease that I think we should be adding to our panel, it is screening for hepatitis C. I think as a service for our patients, this is probably the one that uh, we should be uh, looking at most. And you're looking at chronic hepatitis C rates here uh, uh, increasing since really uh, 2013. Now, a lot of these are in baby boomer age, a lot of them driving the, uh, what I'm calling an epidemic at this point in Washington state are um, injection drug users, but a fair amount of folks uh, that are foreign born have hepatitis C. And I, even though we're not required to screen for this, um, I think we should, and a couple of reasons why I think we should. One, we're having an epidemic, and two, there's a treatment. There is a complete cure for hepatitis C. Um, if you look at the last box I put up here for you, it's really showing that a rate of HIV is, is fairly stable. Um, while indeed it is part of the civil surgeon panel to be screening for HIV, I'm just giving you a background here in Washington State. Those numbers are fairly uh, constant. There has been, uh, and we're not quite sure exactly what this is, but a, a cluster of cases occurring in the Seattle King County area um, does not appear to be associated with foreign-born folks, but um, our HIV rates otherwise across the state remain pretty stable. Okay, next slide. Just to be clear about where your screening for HIV fits in the context of Washington State, there is some major initiatives that occur here in Washington. One of those is a governor-sponsored um, End AIDS Washington campaign. Um, there's this whole use of pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, drug assistance, so PREDAP, uh, 
I'm not sure if many of you are prescribing that. I don't think it's really uh, probably something that many of you are using, but it's essentially antiretrovirals to high-risk folks that may be engaged in high-risk situations to prevent the transmission of HIV. And then there's a big standard of healthcare for LGBTQ persons that comes from what we call a BRE commission here in Washington state. Um, HIV drugs are now on the healthcare authorities preferred drug list. We're working aggressively to modernize our state laws around HIV. Um, if you look at a lot of our HIV laws written here in Washington uh, state, many of them are based on laws written 20 plus even 30 years ago. So we're modernizing those. Clearly, there is no need for pre and post test counseling. There's uh, no need to treat HIV as a stigma. So we shouldn't be stigmatizing folks with HIV. It really should be and is being moved into the same category of bloodborne pathogens. Um, there's a lot of housing funding integration going on in Washington state about finding housing and stable housing for folks with HIV or AIDS. Health disparity data to drive a lot of this work around Washington state. Um, we're, as I'm saying with the laws, we're trying to decrease the stigma of HIV and create HIV as if it were an infectious disease like any other. Um, so there's a coordinator added to this, lots of community engagement going on. And then there's a healthcare peer navigator system. So these are a lot of the background social and public things that are going on, which is why the rates of HIV are not increasing like syphilis and hepatitis C. Next slide. Um, this is really a look, and we do this for a lot of diseases. We look at the total number, so the column on your left is the total number of HIV that are infected. And these are estimated because we don't obviously test everybody. And then the number of those in Washington State that were ever really truly diagnosed, and then move on to this blue and to the other bars to the right there about that engage in any care or ultimately what the goal is to suppress viral load. Now, I, in an ideal world in Washington, of the um, folks we see here, 13,621, we should be testing all of them. We're not, but we're doing a pretty good job. So 12,395 of those, every single one of them should have a suppressed viral load. And we're only achieving about 72% of that suppression. So obviously if you're not suppressing HIV, transmission is ongoing. So this is the background, even though was, um, these numbers are not terrible, there's still a lot of work left to be done in HIV here in Washington state. Next slide. When we, and thanks to a couple of people for these slides, we got a lot of epidemiologists in the room that we can talk to during the day. A lot of the, uh, the slides, the first couple of slides were from Jasmine Matheson. I assume Jasmine, you're in the room there, raise your hand. Um, she is really from our refugee health program and can answer a lot of questions. And then Sean McBrien is our TB epidemiologist. Sean, if you're in the room, raise your hand too. And what these um, epidemiology slides for TB show are when you look at the TB rate since 2008 to 2017, we've had a general trend downwards. If I were to extend this graph to the left back to the 1940s and 50s, it would be through the ceiling. And we've clearly shown a decrease, but what we're doing is really slowing down our rate. Um, we are not decreasing at the same rate we have in uh, generations past, and a lot of that is due to immigration, and that's not a bad thing. It's just simply saying that the majority of our cases are coming from foreign-born folks, so have we reached what is affectionately called the glass floor, where we can't really get this rate much lower um, because the populations that are coming into Washington State, a state with a lot of foreign-born folks, um, will keep us at a national rate or just slightly below. So the TB rates in the U.S. are 2.8 per 100,000. And again, in Washington State for 2017 is 2.8 per 100,000. So next slide. And if you um, look at what these TB rates are by where you were born, essentially, if you look at Washington non-U.S. born, that's the top line there, it is much higher at 15.3 per 100,000 
Um, and also looking at Washington overall at 2.7, 2.8. Um, our rates are much higher in our foreign-born folks, essentially, is what the slide is telling you. Next slide. And the proportional burden, so what percent of the total cases are coming from non-US born? 80%, 79.2% here, or 80% of all our TB in Washington state is in foreign born folks. This is why everyone who is a civil surgeon is on the very front line of screening for TB in Washington state. Um, yes, we do um, target foreign born folks in other ways, but um, as a civil surgeon, this is probably the biggest disease burden that I dealt with in, in those uh, 15 years of being a civil surgeon. And it continues to remain uh, elevated proportion of all the cases in Washington state. Next slide. And if you look um, at it graphically and by race and ethnicity, um, the Asian population and non-US born is our number one percent of all cases. So over 45% of the cases are in the Asian population. Now, um, non-US born black, non-US born Hispanic still remain pretty elevated and not to uh, minimize the native Hawaiian Pacific Islander and American Indian Alaska native. It, these are not foreign born folks for the most part and um, they are a much higher percentage of uh, disease in Washington state than they are of the total population. So there's a lot of disproportionate um, pointers here, at least take home pearls for all of you about um, foreign born folks needing to be screened for sure. And then these high risk populations of native Hawaiian Pacific Islander and Alaska uh, Native American Indian. Next slide. And if you look at the countries of origin um, for Washington state, these are now just non-US born folks, 2015 through 2017. Again, the Philippines, and this is very different for each of your communities. Each of you guys have a community profile that is different. I know that almost 100% of the TB in Kitsap County when I was there was Filipino. So that is very different than some of the counties near me. I was the only civil surgeon for about a four to six county area. Other counties had very high, high proportions of um, Russian immigrants or um, Marshallese folks. So it really depends. You really need to understand the makeup of your community that you're um, acting as a civil surgeon for. Next slide. There's has been this ongoing statistical um, study that was done in Washington state that said, hey, most of the TB presents within the first five years of coming to the United States. And what we're seeing with this slide is there's a change in the epidemiology of this, that while it is true within the first five years, there's a fair amount of TB that's diagnosed, it can go on for 20 plus years. And so I don't think that is a good um, epidemiologic pearl to carry around anymore, that conversion occurs within the first five years as a majority. I think we should view all non-US born folks at from a high risk country where TB is endemic to be a ongoing 20 plus year uh, risk for conversion to active TB. So next slide. Hepatitis C, why I bring this up, and I know this is not something that we are required to screen for as civil surgeons, but hepatitis C is the most common bloodborne infection in the United States. In the US, it kills more people every year than the other reportable infectious diseases combined. And that these hospital costs, just even here in Washington state, are in the millions, that this is a disease and an outbreak and an epidemic with a treatment that I don't think we can ignore just because it's not on our civil surgeon uh, checklist. Next slide. And if you look at acute hepatitis C cases, over time, you can see since 2008 to 2017, those have been on the rise. Now, acute hepatitis C is incredibly hard to diagnose. The majority of acute hepatitis C is either silent or nonspecific, so it's really hard to diagnose this. Um, but nonetheless, of the cases that we do uncover, so just for perspective, there's 73 cases here. I guarantee you we have more than 73 acute cases in Washington State every year. We as clinicians just don't um, capture that. Next slide. 
What we do capture, though, is chronic hepatitis C. So th this is the person that's going to be hard to diagnose, you know, is it acute or not, unless you are looking at antibody plus liver enzyme plus RNA. Um, and this is much more realistic, about 8,800 per year in Washington state. Um, this is a massive increase in the numbers, chronic hep C cases. Next slide. This slide shows us very well when you look at the number of persons with hepatitis C um, versus their birth date, there's this whole, the first box here, whole bump of folks that are affectionately called the baby boomer group. And that is clearly a large number of cases in Washington state. But what we're seeing now is this younger, the second wave, these folks 37 and younger um, that are really associated with injection drug use. So where active disease transmission is occurring is in this group. So the, in a sense, we have two epidemics in Washington state. The first epidemic, the cat is kind of out of the bag. There is no prevention of those cases that have occurred over the last several decades versus preventing the ongoing transmission in this younger age group that's associated with injection drug use. That is the picture in Washington state currently. Next slide. And not every place in Washington state is equally affected. I, I'm interested in everyone's impression on this, but essentially the darker the color, the more cases per 100,000. And it is not in the Puget Sound area. This is really a rural county disease, but it is widespread across the state. I mean, when you look at things like syphilis or gonorrhea, they're much more concentrated in the high population areas like King, Pierce, Snohomish, Thurston, um, whereas chronic hepatitis C is spread much more across the state and higher in rural counties. Next slide. Okay, so I'm sure someone was holding up a slide saying I've got one minute left, so I, um, I'm there. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Scott. And if you don't mind, I'd love to give folks in the room just an, a couple of minutes to ask a question or two if they have them. Sure. Any time for that? Yeah. Okay, terrific. Any questions for Dr. Lindquist? Yes, please. I'm going to bring you the microphone. So the question was, how many civil surgeons are there in the state of Washington? Well, that goes again back to uh, Mackenzie's slides. If you can pull those up, I um, believe she looked at the total number. I, I honestly don't know that off the top of my head, but um, Mackenzie had looked at that. I don't know if Mackenzie's in the room or not. She is. Or if anyone in the room she's holding knows that answer. Right now, ready to jump in. Hi, folks. Okay. Uh, it was great surveying a lot of you. Thank you so much for responding. Um, so there were 84 total civil surgeons identified a year ago. I think maybe for today's registration, we had 87, I want to say. So 85, 80 to 90, let's put it that way. Not quite sure about that exact number. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? I think we have a moment for maybe one or two. All right. If there aren't any more questions for you, Scott, thank you so much for making time for us today. Yeah. Can I ask one question of the group, and you'll just have to translate uh, how many hands go up. How many of you in the room can reasonably screen for hepatitis C in addition to your civil surgeon duties? How feasible is that? Um, if you could raise your hand if you think that is, and maybe you already do it, but raise your hand so I can get a sense of how feasible you think screening for hepatitis C would be. All right, I'm counting. I'm hearing that it's a cost issue for the patients, but I think I saw roughly 20 hands go up, maybe 15 to 20. Is that about a, a correct estimate? Okay. Okay, all right. So yes. at least some traction. Yeah, and I do understand the cost issue for the um, patients. And, okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.